Welcome. I'm David Levi Strauss, chair of the MFA program in art criticism and writing here at the at School of Visual Arts. Uh, Carolee asked me not to say very much, so I'm going to read from my collected works. Um, <laughs> no, I've written about Carolee's work a number of times over the years, and uh, this is something, just a little bit of something I wrote recently, most recently in an essay that will be in my next book, and the essay is called Revolt, she said. Um, Carolee Schneemann has been in permanent revolt against misogyny and its myriad concealed weapons and malevolent instruments, against body hatred and beauty killers, against repress repressive ideologies and their cowardly enablers, and also against conventional approaches to art making for all of her adult life. And apparently before that, she told Linda Montano in 1982 that as a young child she knew that she could, quote, locate naturalists by making images and by loving, image making and love making being naturally entwined or fused. And that, and that, quote, when sex negativity and the ordinary sexual abuse and depersonalization that females experience in our culture intruded, I tried to judge it, sort it out, not internalize it. I suppose that not internalizing prohibitions gave me some messianic sense of what I, that I was going to have to be uh, that I was going to have to confront or go against erotic denial, fragmentations. The current issue of Millennium Film Journal is focused on Carolee's film works and, and they're on sale outside. Uh, and the new book Correspondence Course and Epistolary History of Carolee Schneemann and Her Circle is also available. Um, even though we talked about it at length leading up to his um, I still have no idea what she's going to do tonight because I never do. Please welcome Carolee Schneemann. at a moment when really we should all be waiting for the storm and occupying Wall Street. And <clears throat> having done that through the Vietnam War, this is both uh, inspiring, encouraging, and quite terrifying because the forms, I don't know you, I didn't know you could sing birthday like that. It was my birthday yesterday and I had such a nice Austrian birthday call. Uh, so, the systematic resistance is certainly something we all have to regard and study and organize within and without. Um, but I'm going to go way back in time to this strange iconography which uh, evolved when my mom died and I found a basket of not a basket of kittens, a basket of drawings. And I thought, they're probably not very interesting. I should just toss them. But as I uh, went through them, I thought, there's something 
quite curious and interesting here. For inst inst instance, this first one, uh, that apple symbol is going to follow me into the present time. And the feminist sense that in order to really fulfill your motion, you need three legs. <laughs> so this is a work about momentum, a very early work for the Judson, lateral splay. And uh, I'm moving from my painting off the canvas with the sense that could I uh, energize physicalities with the dy dynamism that painting had had for me. So there's that sense of, in the early work for me, each stroke was an event in terms of the paint building its surface. So this was an early choreographic work for the Judson Dance Theater and uh, lateral splay. The energy was to be propulsive as fast, as intense as possible and to result in collision. And so in order to balance collision, I began to, um, to study musculature, to throw myself off of ladders, to find ways that my participants, who were usually not trained dancers, could rehearse and practice until our momentum was secure. So you could, we could learn to fall and impact walls and each other with tremendous frightening noise and never get hurt. So that became a principle. And uh, here I find it in a very, a very early drawing. It's probably four years old. And I'm uh, quite taken with it because I call it the exuberant cat. And it's, it's such an amazing uh, energy and an anti-gravitational lift. And I think the head of the cat is really drawn well. It's so... Um, cat-like. Now there's a mystery to this uh, drawing which I'm going to follow up at a, at a, at a later image time. Um, Annette, can I have the coffee that was there, please? It's time for some energy drugs here. Okay. Starbucks to the rescue. Thank you. I've been watching uh, the comedian, uh, what's her name, Cho? Margaret, Margaret, yeah, and she really takes time. She's very interesting. She'll just stand there and generate an impulse. So I'm going to practice that a little bit. Um, so following the exuberant cat, I went right to um, 1975 to the origin of a work most of you know, um, Up To Including Her Limits. So Up To Including Her Limits starts with um, attention to an anti-gravitational balance, um, the sense of flexibility, freedom, and, and momentum. And of course, it's had uh, a lot of difficulty in its origin because the elements were um, constructed of a nude woman on a rope with a harness had to be part of s &M. So that was a struggle to reintegrate my intentions. Uh, this is my first uh, kind of nude portrait of a man sort of a man, it's, it's, it's very curious. It's my brother in a carriage. I know it's my brother, so I'm four years old. And it's so carefully observed from the side, so uh, you can make out his head, right? And he's throwing a toy. And those of you who uh, have over-sexualized my work are going to be confused about those. Those are little booties, right? On the other hand, it's going to um, be predictive of my portrait of my partner. Um, I think this is 19, probably maybe 1960. Uh, it's a portrait of James Tenney, the composer. He's being the model, he's being the muse, because he's exhausted and he's going to take a nap and I need to work from the figure. But this 
piece was considered um, obscene, incorrect um, at Bard College. They took it off the wall of the sophomore exhibit. And so I, I think everybody here probably has a, a clear idea. Well, maybe you don't. Well, would anyone venture a guess of why it was considered obscene? Yeah. Sorry, say it louder. Yeah, he's, his genitals are exposed. And then what's so bad about that? Women's pussies have been uh, ad nauseum in history. Yeah, he's vulnerable. And it's considered an affront because people know him. He's not supposed to be depicted like that. That's, the girls do that. We're constantly stripping for the painting boys. Uh, so I hadn't considered it. I thought it was a really important step for color field when I was, <laughs> yeah, getting a hold of that. And also you'll see there are three pussies in this. You all see them? Uh, this is my historic cat, Kit. She's moving around while I'm painting, and so I have three versions her, of her. And that was very satisfying for the uh, domestic configuration. And then, then I find this very odd drawing that contains several of my uh, concerns, even obsessions. Here, the cat is... I, it's not drawn well, we know that, but it, <laughs> it was better when I was four years old. This is probably five or six, it's getting mannerist. But <laughs> the, the narrative is completely controlled by the, my assumption of the intentionality of the cat. The cat dominates whatever this image is about. And the image is also concerned with the fragmentation of the staircase. And I'm going to show you a whole relay of these indented planes. Um, so it was very difficult to do my little version of the dance on these um, inverted planes because I have a torn meniscus and I like to do it when there's not a bunch of steps. I still have a problem with the gravitational position of the staircase when you put your foot here and this one goes up. I don't know where the body really is anymore. And you'll see this is a, a constant theme in the childhood drawings. The mysterious staircase, where does it go? What's the surround? Is it like a filmic slice? Is it a, a cut of narrative? Here's a staircase, number 53. And we see it has no resolution whatsoever. There's a hand reaching out. There's going to be a lot of uh, curious hand contacts through the early drawings, but we don't know where that hand is balanced. Uh, I assume this is my brother on the stairs, sort of with uh, socks. And some domestic object. Now, the domestic object has those uh, energy lines coming out of it. It's probably a vase of some sort. Those energy lines are going to be a recurrent theme, even into my uh, most recent work, and the inexplic inexplicable insistence on these energy lines. So in... Um, in the 60s, I'm working with collage. I'm in at the University of Illinois, and it's a painting that has in it an ordinary object. It's the first work with an ordinary object, and it's uh, here's a vase of some sort, huge, and then the ordinary object here is a broken red cup that belonged to my grandmother that seemed important. But I couldn't solve the structure of this work until I put on the right, this vertical that looks like uh, indented stairs, that piece of wood that you can see, that solved the structure of the work. And I had carried this piece of wood around, oh, maybe for eight or nine years, wherever I went. I found it in the street, probably New York City at some point, and it just went with me. 
This is the most mysterious drawing of all, and uh, I like to look at it with uh, an audience and think about it. What, what is it? And I couldn't find any connection to older work or more recent work, which, which is the pleasure of this iconography, until I began to see the gloves and the hands. Uh, this homage to Lou Andrea Salome is a complicated research to uh, bring forward from her debased history, a figure that was very influential and powerful to me, and had consistently been vilified for her intense relationship to Freud, to Tolstoy, to Nietzsche. So I'm using photographs of her and all these gloves, and then I start to see these fragmented hands, and something about uh, the linear centrality. And I don't understand it at all. It seems as if uh, it's, it's observed something observed from above, as if it was a train, but I can't imagine how that could be. There's two little figures running away on the upper left. Uh, there's <laughs> erasure, hands reaching out. It's, it's a very charged mystery there, and it began to remind me of what the government uh, is planning for us. What's it called? Um, Eye in the Sky. So have you all read about that? And a new surveillance construction that will uh, float above cities and places where people congregate and begin to estimate potential subversive action. Uh, stay tuned for that one. Yeah. And, and briefly, towards the middle of the 60s, moving towards performative ideas, with uh, failed canvases were turned into sculptures. Um, this is Colorado House, and the only person who ever thought it was okay was Alan Capro, so that meant a lot. Uh, I'm going to show three brief meet joys, so we're in 64, because they're really the quintessential uh, gathering and um, envisioning of a group energy and a static energy. There's a, a remastered edit that's complete. I finally got all the lost material in Electronic Arts has it, and I think it looks good. These are early drawings for Snows, the anti-Vietnam work, which uh, really overshadowed or, or was the dark pull around my uh, aesthetic works, around surrounding me, joy, surrounding fuses, was this endless, relentless, diabolical war. And I was quite obsessed with it to the point where I could, um, I saw bodies in my woods, I saw bodies close to, to where, where I was living. And uh, let me find the notes for this one. So, the energy against the Vietnam War was so intense and conflicted, but there was um, a theater owner who turned over the Martinique Theater on 34th Street to me because he knew I wanted to do um, an installation of kinetic theater work against the war, and he let that theater be dark for three weeks. Well, I built this uh, in crazy kind of installation. I wanted to have huge magnifying lenses, and the closest I could get to them for projecting film would be uh, filling colored bags of water and uh, making um, a grid structure. It was very dangerous because all the electronics were in a circle, and the electronics were projection systems, sound, Vietnam atrocity images, and they, all the electronics were controlled by the audience. They had switching systems under every third seat, but they didn't know that their actions were either slowing or speeding up their projections. 
which meant that all the cues for the participants constantly changed. So it was a very intense and uh, properly stressed. We didn't know who was going to be in what position during the sequences. It's 1965, so it's early, and my film, Viet Flakes, is made from these uh, suppressed atrocity images. A lot of them had to come from European magazines. The country, of course, wanted to be righteous and uh, not vulnerable, as someone said. Yeah. Then, then this anti-gravitational work I <clears throat> seemed to go from uh, dark intensities to something more luminous and here uh, trying to recalibrate space through suspending bodies. And again, this all started with a whole series of drawings in which I wanted to switch uh, horizon lines. And I had no idea that you, in order to move on the ropes as I needed us to do, that it would take about three weeks to build calluses and muscle memory. We just couldn't get up there like a drawing. This was in uh, the good old days that I always remind the audience just to make them a little miserable when we found whole huge half a city block lofts in the middle of New York City for $70 a month, 7 0, yes. And where I could build this dangerous structure in the middle of St. Mark's Church without any insurance, just, just no fuss. <laughs> and then we took it outside. So this is going to take uh, us back to up to including her limits. When my friend, uh, the tree surgeon, leaves his harness and three-quarter inch middle rope, it reminds me of what I was building for water light, water needle. And here again, I, I relate it to the exuberant cat. Right? It's, it's a nice connection. But here's the mystery about the exuberant cat. That's probably a four-year-old drawing. Last year, I, w I had a commission in Liverpool, and I came upon <laughs> this construction. I thought, well, that's just like the energy strokes in the exuberant cat. What's that doing there? I guess a lot of you know. Do you know what it is? I mean, any engineering student knows, but I thought it was just magical. So I photographed it and put it upside down with uh, the energy strokes coming out of the cat. Well, it's rebar, and that's pretty interesting. Rebar is um, a layer of thin steel elements between layers of poured concrete. It helps the poured concrete layers uh, become attached. Did anybody know that already? Yeah. <laughs> well, then you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have had the magic moment of <laughs> what could this be? Um, sustained energy field. The up to including her limits is uh, a work that proceeds over the course of five or six years in different spaces, and then incorporating various forms of projection. Um, I could never get anyone to show the whole installation. I worked on it probably from about 70, oh, for, for five or six years, six, seven years. No one would show it. Fortunately, as some of you know, it was just at MoMA in their history of 20th century drawing, and you uh, couldn't be more thrilled than to have that. Here's this troublesome image that. Um, Heaven knows why it's been in every art history book for the past 10 years after being vilified, after being responsible for my losing many teaching jobs, many. And not everyone knows it was just a simple little drawing that said the message. Uh, and then it finally evolved to incorporating the written text, which I prefer to the singular images, which are um, they're, they're a little programmatic. 
And then, you know, I kept all the scrolls in a cigar box rolled up because I thought I should throw them out. But then it turned out that collectors were really not interested in hardly anything else I ever did. They all say, where, where, where's the scroll? <laughs> so I got it out of the cigar box and uh, Elga Wimmer was working with my work at the time and she sold it for $16,000 16, to a major collector. And then later people, collectors said, we were running with our checkbooks to try and get a hold of that thing. Uh, meanwhile, my sister quite firmly said, uh, they're completely disgusting. Um, but then they began to develop an iconographic reference for me. And, and that was very gratifying. So we've got a, a skinny Giacometti on one side and um, a Brancusi, an infinite inverted form. And of course, uh, look. A staircase, here it is again, um, and, 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 and the fractured plane. Yeah, the side view is very important. I think the side view gives it another uh, sculptural implication. Oh, and wait, here we go. Now look. In the 80s, I was studying uh, Palestinian culture and the systematic destruction attack um, and really ruination of it by the Israeli government which included destroying 100-year-old orchards and olive groves and actually moving the Latani River, which was a central uh, river that went between, uh, through Palestine. And I made a uh, warm-up. Warm-up is um, an oddity, I guess. It's a sculpture that attacks the monitor on which there's a, a continuous pan through destroyed Palestinian villages, and some of the footage that's on the video is uh, especially disturbing. So to balance the work that's most known, which tends to be uh, almost rigidly sexualized, as if I'm not allowed to grow up with my other materials, um, I'll show you some of the other more recent work, Devour, from, Kathy said six years ago, do you know Devour? I wanted to uh, compose a projection installation that would juxtapose normalcy, the fragility of normalcy, with some of the most uh, disturbing war material that had been sent to me almost by accident from a collective in Sarajevo just turned up in my mailbox, and it was um, astonishing interviews with um, murderers, victims, and the collective itself that had a, a, a run-on statement on the film that said, um, this might be our last camera, this might be our last film, we are out of food, we are out of water, we want this to reach you. Yeah. 
So that was uh, just a really engrossing, tough edit. The, actually, the first imagery I started with was with the spaghetti. I wanted to get that as uh, pervasive and noxious as possible. So I'm just going to show uh, two more works, and then I'll be interested in any of the comments from, from you, from the audience. There's, let's see if this is ready to go again. Yeah, this is a snafu. It's a work that I don't understand at all. Um, and I think that's fair because my students always expect that there's something uh, programmatic or at least uh, conceptually set. set. Um, it's an anti-gravitational work in some sense that these little uh, baptism coats it's really echoey, huh? No, it's not just to me? OK. Um, they're covered in plaster and other materials. And then they're motorized. Each coat has its own motor with its own computer chip. So their rhythms are, are never the same. I saw, uh, somehow I saw, that I needed a vertical horse race superimposed on these um, white ghost jackets as they were moving up and down in space. And through another remarkable coincidence, I went to, um, to Nova Scotia for one of Jim Tenney's last concerts where he was playing the Ives Sonata. Uh, and I just went, and uh, nobody knew I was there, and I got a room and put the TV on, and there was the horse race I needed, and my camera, the battery was charged, and it was in focus, and, uh, and that's a set of miracles, right? So I'm going to show you the, uh, the video of Snafu. It's very short, and you might have some thoughts as to what it's about.
Yeah, there, there's going to be um, a broken flange coming in also. Look at that. There it is again. See? So the um, the next to the last work was um, also very troublesome, politically problematic. Terminal velocity um, is a sequence that really related to uh, my erotic film fuses and to my in memoriam film Mortal Coils for Dead Friends. I wanted to. Um, not especially make a work, but to get as close to the bodies and the images as I could. And since they, I could get them from newspapers for a time, and then you can enlarge the uh, bende dot. Of course, from video, the pixel breaks up right away, so that was useless. So th how large do they look? Yeah, that's about the, that's close to the actual scale. There were many issues for me one being the physiological fact that everyone is falling so differently. In my mind, it was somehow uh, the image of a, the way cats are supposed to fall and turn around with their feet front. There's, uh, the gravitational pull is completely unique for each body. Some have been, some of the uh, personages here jumped and others were blown out by the force of the fire behind them. The strange thing began to happen was the resemblance of the building verticals to an, a, an inverted American flag. That began to seem uh, extremely sinister and telling. It was first exhibited at Elga Wimmer's gallery shortly after 9-11, and many people who viewed it went nuts. And I related to what we said about the um, vulnerability, the exposed image of James Tenney. Some of the comments were, you have no right to uh, look at people Look at these men, it's ex this group is exclusively men. Um, when they're dying, when they're victims, when they don't have the American sense of uh, self-righteous survival, and issues around that. So I had to write a statement with it saying that uh, what my feeling was, that it was a work for In Memoriam. And you remember they wrote horrible things around the gallery walls and tried to deface the piece, and uh, that was probably more shocking than the kinds of censorship that I've had with um, the erotic works. So the last work I want to show tonight is, of course, my favorite because it's the most recent. Uh, precarious is a multi-channel projection that um, moves 360 degrees through space through a mirror system that I build, but it's a mirror system that I also used about 25 years ago so that the images are in superimposition, in a kind of collision. 
um, a penetration of each other. And it's a work about um, being dancing as uh, entrapment. The orange figures on your left are the prisoners from the Philippines who, uh, whose discipline is to dance in choreographed um, means to popular music. And they're very energetic, it's exciting, it's terrific. My other imagery um, is of a bear. I was also researching brutality to animals and came across a great deal of material, early material in uh, Eastern Europe where bears and small animals were gathered and uh, impaled and put on ropes and made to dance or play instruments. And then uh, there's the famous cockatiel that I think you all know, uh, Snowball. And it, it is a male, and he lives in Indiana. He's a rescue bird, and he's being studied because he's a captive, but he loves to dance, and he changes his beat. He dances in perfect rhythm to any change in the music that's being played around him. Uh, I couldn't make a whole film about him. He belongs to YouTube. But, uh, and then there's two sequences where I'm also dancing in the sense of captive in the frame, captive in the history. The name Precarious happened because this was one of the only commissions I've ever had. And Liverpool called, and, and it was going very fast. I was really editing fast. Usually I work almost for years. This was just clicking along. And Liverpool called and said, we need a title right away for press. I said, oh, I have no idea. I'm in the middle of it. And I put the phone down. I said, this is just really precarious. So I went to the dictionary and looked up precarious. I think, I like the word. And uh, the first one said, uh, Thackeray described horses and carriages as precarious. And uh, Shakespeare mentioned some fighting teams as precarious. And then the third reference was life in Liverpool during the Second World War was precarious. So we just have, you know, it's not the work, it's a document of it. And I think it's just five minutes.
projector guys, thank you so much. It's nice and smooth with just a few little glitches. Well, I'm happy to see so many friends here. Thank you, thank you for getting here. <clears throat> and <clears throat> any any simple-minded or not interesting question is welcome. Why you've got me here? I'm just wondering if anybody was hurt in any of the the sequences, the dancers in your career. And the second question is, were, how have you been hurt by being dismissed from um, any of the, your teaching jobs? What was the first question? Was I'm anybody hurt. physically hurt in, in when physically you, hurt? Mm, the, the people that in, in the performances. Yeah. Uh, endurance, not pain. I don't work with, I try to avoid pain. Uh, endurance is as much pain as I uh, want to construct. But pain as such, no, lots of other artists are working with pain and doing it uh, very well. So I don't have to do pain. I might do uh, fields of disturbance, absolutely. And being hurt without the jobs, it, it, you, you know, this work was shit on for so many years, I'm always happy when something positive happens and I'm still a bit uh, incredulous, yeah. Why did you move away from painting and move to other media? What was the impetus there? Oh, that was very painful. I wanted extended material and events in actual time and space. And it was uh, when I was in college and I thought I was going to lose my mind. I did not want to stop painting. But the painting became more and more dimensional. The collage aspect uh, became more intense, larger. And finally, I was pushed out into um, imagery that was um, in actual time. It happened for a lot of people, you know, certainly uh, the most interesting artists I met when I came to New York were Oldenburg and Dine and Whitman, and they were all painters working with extended materials and incredible colors and uh, close impacted physicalities. The thing that's different is that when they went back to sculpture and painting and installation, they weren't um, trapped by having once been naked or worked with um, physicality, the culture allowed them a dimensionality that it's been very resistant. And so I've been saying lately, my use of the body interfered with my body of work. And it's still the same. They only, you know, when, when, you know, you have to be very happy that some imagery enters the culture but it's been pretty stuck on two same things over and over and over again. Carol Lee, do you have a ritual that you perform before you speak? Do, I do, um, what? do you have a ritual that you do before you perform or speak? Do, do I have a ritual before I perform or speak? I go into a numb place. I'm like somewhere else. And also I get very sick the day before. I just can't move. I think I'm just coming down with something that must be death. Uh, but then I see other friends of mine have that. Joan, Joan is for one, you know, I'll see her in the street and say, Joan, hi, how are you? And she gives me that look like, oh, hello, Carly. You know, it's, oh, it's okay. All right, when you're out of there, call me. Uh, do, do any other people in this audience do that? Yes, here's one, okay. <laughs> Shake your head, yes. <laughs> and there's one I know, Larry. Yes, of course, yeah. Yeah, it's weird. He says it's like going through a curtain of fire to get to the audience. And you're saying yes? You too? I can't hear her, and I'm sure I would like to run with the microphone anyway. This is Ann Waldman, 
a poet who inspires us and seems to have fearless speaking courage. So, well, just there's an all before performing, before meeting, you know, going out to meet the public, and it can be this sort of meditative state, but it's very, um, you know, just arising to that occasion. You go through a whole collapse of your ego. You're just this hairy bag of water, and what are you doing, you know, recrystallizing for <laughs> an audience? But then, and voice, you know, sometimes I think I'm losing my voice, and then it, of course, miraculously arises. No, it's heartening to hear your, you know, that sense of, it, it, it is a kind of ritual yeah. sort of journey. Yeah, it's kind of miraculous. So you, you don't know where, I don't know where it comes from when it's okay. I sure know when it's not working. That's a horrible place to be. We're just not coherent or, or that, I, I, for me it's in the back here somewhere. It, it starts working itself. Yeah, <laughs> it's not here. <laughs> Somebody up there, yeah. Hi, uh, did you ever think more about, as an adult, why you made the staircase drawings as a child? Um, well, I'm looking at this staircase now. What's your thought about it? Since, what, where are you with the question? Tell me something. Well, I, I find, I, I think, I thought they were beautiful, uh, and uh, it takes you somewhere, or it brings you to another place. So it's a, it's a way of connecting one thing to another. Well, as also the French have that wonderful saying, does anybody know it, the staircase to the place where you forgot what you were really meaning to say? It's a wonderful French expression. L'escalier de, who knows it? Oh, here, take the microphone, it's nice to hear it. It's l'esprit de l'escalier. L'esprit de l'escalier, the spirit of the staircase. Um, no, I haven't figured it out, but the similarity to the fold in interior scroll and the indentation in uh, the piece of wood that was so significant to me. And then I just saw those indentations in Snafu. I just saw them yesterday for the first time. I don't know what they are, but they're, they're in, did anybody see them? They're black? And it's a pattern. Yeah, so. It's satisfying for me. <laughs> I, I, do I still paint currently? When I'm editing video, I think I'm close to painting because of how I think about it dimensionally and in terms of color. But it also gives me more of a time factor so that I'm working with counts and beats and rhythm and once I get to that aspect of the work, I have to uh, say that I lived with the composer for the most crucial early 10, 12 years of my life. And so there was that constant interplay and um, juxtaposition of his working with Ives, that kind of multiplicity of sound and the composers we were friends with who were so absorbed in repetition, the phrase over and over and over again until it was what they thought could be right. Hi, Juan. <laughs> Hi. Do you, do you find it easier to talk about your work in retrospect or as you create it? Hi. Oh, you're speaking there in the I'm dark. I'm speaking okay. here in the dark. <laughs> Say it again. Do you find it easier to speak about your work in retrospect or as you're creating it? Probably in retrospect, but as I'm, when I'm editing, I'm very aware of the material, the units, the time count. Um, but editing's pretty mysterious, you know. I would edit, I, I had probably hundreds of images for Devour, hundreds, and then I had to pare them down and pare them down. Then I was left with one little unit that I couldn't integrate. And that's that little splash of colored lights. They're very blue and shiny. And I, I wanted them to be there somehow. And there's only one phrase or fragment in Devour that wasn't um, intensely edited. Everything, every, every image in there has been through so many electronic processes in terms of 
slowing it down, speeding it up, coloring. Um, does anyone remember what might have been the only phrase in Devour that had never been touched? <laughs> well, it'd be odd if you did. It's, it's all the people work, walking so obsessively towards the next hot dog. I, I didn't have to touch that sequence at all. I just had to place it. I, I couldn't do anything to it. <laughs> Carolee, you, you, about Snafu and the, uh, and the white coats. On Saturday, um, Occupy Wall Street is going to be, after maybe being made homeless tomorrow morning, homeless from being homeless, there's going to be a Times Square event, and everybody's supposed to wear white. Okay. What time are people going to be in Times Square? Uh, I think at five Saturday. What? I think at five o'clock. Five o'clock. Yeah, I, I hope we can all go because every physical presence is like a a, a crumb of contribution. There was um, a night when Rauschenberg, years ago, gave a party. When, when Rauschenberg sold a work, he always gave a party and fed all his friends. Everybody went and drank and ate, and there was, it was just such a wonderful communal uh, luxury. And the next morning, the buses were leaving to go to the Pentagon to, to raise the Pentagon to face all the police. And we told Bob that we were going to stay up all night and get on a bus at four in the morning and go. And he said, no, 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 don't go. You have to, uh, you know, stay strong and healthy and protect yourself. Don't go into any danger zone because the art you make is so significant. Well, he wasn't sure of it then, but that's kind of what he said. And we said, we have to go just to add to whatever density needs to be there. Um, and we went, and it was a nightmare. But it was crucial to participate. I'm just, um, um, I would really love to have your thoughts from all your experience in practices of resistance. If you have any, um, any sort of, I don't like the word advice, but I, I can't think of a better word right now. Um, but if you have any advice for the younger generation and um, the uh, Wall Street movement and all the other social movements that have been emerging around the world from, from your I'm experience. so proud of Adbusters. You know, I've been reading it obsessively. I had no idea that it was you know, like a, a dragon in flames that was reaching out and uh, making a coherent activation and organizing statements for all of us to relate to. And I also brought for tonight uh, what I think is a really remarkable journal that, do any of, of you know White Fungus from New Zealand? Okay, well keep your eye out. It, it's from New Zealand and it's um, j just remarkable political analysis and analysis of corporate subversions and deviations and aspects of the power structure that are hidden from us. It's, a, it's very brave and it's rather f funny. And what he manages to do, and it's, uh, he has several names, but what he manages to do is to cull and organize a very powerful realm of um, important quotations, compilations. So I would add that to your research. And then uh, my real advice, I guess, is to go to a very dark place. Go on the internet and look up uh, HARP. Um, look up chemtrails. Look up medical anal anomalies. Uh, don't be afraid. It's horrible. Find out all that you can and then keep your aspects of pleasure and joy and trust the work you have to do. Uh, I don't know how to make that clear, but trusting the work for me has always had to do with the areas of research that I could commit myself to so that I was getting 
a sense of uh, structure and ballast and history, how I felt, although it had been denied to women for hundreds of years and also to my generation, but I felt there was a history that I had to belong to, uh, to shape, to penetrate, or to just chew on the edge of it. And of course, it's all changed, and um, the activism is astounding, and um, uh, it won't be repressed. You know, everything in cultural anomalies has opened up so that what women make and do and create is part of the discussion. I have no questions, but on behalf of the audience and myself, I would like to say happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carolee. Thank you, everybody. Great to be here.